I would like to talk about a very easy subject for me, and that is nature. Whether it be the nature of the lofty air we breathe, the wavy waters that provides the way of the tour for the ship to sail the seven seas of the world. The creeks that flow down from the mountain, the river that flows out to the mighty seas. The fires that make the sound of when a volcano is born and a fissure opens up and we hear that mighty sound and we see the mighty glow of life given Blessed is the sailor that has experienced that rare moment when they first see the land from deep below the surface of the sea rise above the surface of the many waters. The sight, the sound, the smell is all marvelous to behold. And the sailor that has beholden such can learn a lot about the nature of life beneath the sea and above the sea beneath the land and above the land. It's easy for me to talk about the nature of plants, animals, and people. But there is a flip side to that, which is easy for me and many around the world whom find it easy to to observe nature and its beauty. <clears throat> nature is a living law of God, that great oneness within this mysterious world that we are now tasting. But the flip side is, for the many, unfortunately, especially here in America, find it most difficult to understand nature because they have not taken the time to meditate, to observe that living, wondrous, living law of God. The law of the creation, the law of the council of creation. Many people unbeknown to them, are so busy trying to get out from under the debt of the dollar. The dollar is that which, for the most part, is unnatural. The dollar represents 
the nature of a thief, a murderer, an assassin, a troublemaker. And the dollar is both a symbolic, abstract tool that is used to bind the people into debt. Even on the dollar bill it says, on the Federal Reserve note it says, this is a legal tender to pay all debt. And here in America, all of us <clears throat> folk that are listening to the goodness and wants that goodness to flourish, to blossom into a beautiful flower. called freedom or sovereignty or liberty for we the people. Unfortunately here in America it has become a playground so to speak for I the selfish. It's like an Amish man told me over 20 years ago. We were talking about the town of Ravenwood that our family lives in. And I was talking about the greed and the selfishness of the rich people that control the small town. And my Amish friend said, yeah, it's all about number one. And my Amish friend pointed out that, you know, we care for one another. We have a community and we look out for one another. And he said, you people in Ravenwood could easily do the same thing. Care for one another and all you, all you folks would have a house and food and you would be, you would be growing food and you would be um, taking care of animals and you would care for one another. And that's the way that Jesus taught to love thy neighbor as thyself, to do unto others as you will have them to do unto you. And also not to do unto others what you don't want them to do to you. And it's only 100% natural to have a traditional family, a traditional community, a traditional nation wherein people care for one another. And that, that to nature that I have observed in little children. When I was a little child, I eagerly wanted to work and to participate in making things with my hands, good things such as a boat or, or to build a furniture, to build a house, to draw beautiful pictures, to be colorful and beautiful. That, that's natural. But when a child <clears throat> grows up in, a, in an unnatural environment where in most everything is ugly and um, they get used to that and then that child thinks that's normal. But blessed be all the people when we come together and embrace beauty, the beauty of nature, the beauty of the forest and the rivers and the mountains 
and all that have been given to us by the grand council of creation, or in other words, the grand council of the sculpture, or that sculpture, or the shapers, the shapers of beauty. For every flower on earth is beautiful. And the disruption of nature or the natural order, or rather, better said, the natural self-standing order, it behooves us to appreciate the living law. When something is written on paper, all it can do is point to something that is alive if it's written properly. For well, nature came first, for an example. It used to be that paper was made from papyrus, and still is in many places of the world today. And the simple, easy question I ask is, what came first, the papyrus plant or the paper that is made from the papyrus plant. Nature gives us papyrus first. So I can write on paper that I am able to write on this paper because of the nature of papyrus being a good fiber to make good paper. And that's the way we're supposed to look at things. So, again, I say it's easy for me to talk about nature. It's easy for me to explain the workings of that symbolic expression we call the alphabet. And people don't realize that all that we say, all that we do, all our movements of our body and the voice and the ability to make sounds such as the voiceless shh or the voiceless t or another voiceless t or another voiceless or or the voiceless and then to make a sound with our voice all this is only possible because we are alive in the nature of the mighty creation of the sun, the earth, the moon, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, the stars. So it behooves all of us to learn to appreciate life. For all who study nature and meditate upon Nature with appreciation, appreciate the lofty air we breathe. Appreciate the malacca I'm drinking now. This is sheep malacca. I, I like saying malacca rather than milk. I first came in contact with sheep milk about a few weeks ago. My Amish friend he used to have a lot of cows. But as he got older and his children grew up and started their own family, he went to taking care of sheep. And that makes perfect sense because sheep is more gentle and more easier to manage for older people. 
And um, so a few weeks ago when I tasted sheep milk for the first time, I was like, this is really good. He gave me the first jar of milk. It was a quart size, and he wanted me to try the sheep milk to make sure I like it first. <clears throat> he says some people don't like it, and some people do. Me being 67 years old, maybe that just makes it taste better because I noticed that throughout my life, my taste buds have changed a little bit. I remember when I was a little boy, I, um, if I took a lemon and squeezed it in my mouth, I would go, ooh, I would pucker like crazy. But now, when I eat a lemon, it, it tastes sweet to me. When I was a little boy, I ate something that was unnatural. It's called white sugar. Now, a lot of people don't know that white sugar is totally unnatural. It's a refined product. Um, natural, natural sweet is the color of nature. It can be uh, brown or orange is brown in color. And there's natural that which is in its full natural state. And uh, in its original state, the white sugar comes from a plant we call the sugar cane. And um, again, I'm gonna go back to um, the Amish folk. We have here in our home um, gallons of, I think it's called black molasses or just molasses. Some people call it sorghum and, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it. <laughs> you can call it brown, uh, brown sweet if you want to, whatever. Well, that's natural sweetness. That's natural sugar. And um, it's loaded with vitamins. It's loaded with good stuff because it's in its natural state. It's nature. But we have thieves among us here in America that takes that same product and take it to a refinery and remove all the fibers and natural colors and the natural sweetness. And, and and they remove all the good stuff, and then what's left over is that white powder. And um, it causes disease. It'll it'll eat your teeth out of your head. It will not. Um, it does not provide nutrition. And um, thinking here for a minute. A lot of people don't realize that when you take something like this so-called white sugar and they put it in a storehouse, it can stay in that storehouse for 10 years. And it's still sold in the market as a Hmm. The misnomer of thinking that it's fresh, but it's not. The molasses we partake of is very dark and um, very sweet. And it does not take much of it, but it's in its liquid form. Like honey is in a liquid form, even though it's a crystal, but we still refer to it as a liquid. But in reality, it's a crystal, and so it is with the molasses. And So, let me describe a little bit the natural process. I went out to get some molasses one day, and 
We watched them gather the sugar cane from the field and they put it in the, I'm not sure exactly how it works, some type of a compressor thing that, that went through a roller and it squeezed the juice out of the sugar cane plant. And the and and they removed the pulp of the sugar cane and the outside shell was discarded or separated. <clears throat> and I notice Amish don't waste anything. That discarded shell can also be used for some other purposes. Um may be allowed to deteriorate and use it for compost or to put in a garden or to cover, you know, flower beds and so forth. You know, I don't know what, what all they use it for, but they use it for something good that's natural. And that's one of the understanding of nature is to understand that everything has its place, proper place. And I noticed all the pulp of the sugar cane went into this big container and there was a a fire under that baller, and they use a uh, log to for their fire, and they boil it for so long. I don't know how long because I've never made it myself. But after a while, you have this really thick, dark molasses, and they pour that into. Um, five gallon containers and that's how you buy it you buy it in five gallon containers I don't know where that five gallon container is my site bad I don't know where half the stuff is in this house anymore but my children know and um, but it, it, it keeps uh, I guess it keeps practically forever you know um and just like honey, you know, honey keeps for many years in a five-gallon bucket. And uh, in its natural state, it doesn't spoil. And it makes the best cookie, the best cake. And the big plus side of it is that which is natural doesn't eat your teeth. And um, I'm not saying you can just pile stuff on your teeth and not clean your teeth. I'm saying that within reason, um, it, it's not as, let me see if I can come up with the right word. It's not as invasive as, um, the unnatural white sugar. Unnatural white sugar, as soon as it comes in contact with your teeth, now I can't eat it anymore. I used to eat it years ago, but I quit eating it about, oh, I, it was over 30 years ago. Um, the benefits of that, I have a, uh, uh, my son Benjamin, he's never had a cavity. And he religiously stays away from that white sugar stuff. And uh, by the time I married my sweetheart, I was 28 years old, I had already lost some of my teeth because of cavities. Because back then I did not know better that it was the sugar that was eating my teeth, among other things. So we immediately started using honey, and honey does not cause cavities. And, um, but anyway, we can talk about many things that are natural and many things that are unnatural. So it behooves us to study nature, to study the nature of the human body and what what is good for the human body is since the human body is of the earth, then what we eat must be in its natural state from the earth, and that's what's best for us. And stay away from that, which is refined food products, because they're there 
for the greedish. I said greedish. I don't even think I've ever used that word before. <laughs> Instead of saying greedy, I said the greedish. <laughs> or the greediest. <laughs> anyway, the greedish, uh, the greedish people, the ones that so-called the money lord, they, they make a lot of money from these unnatural products because these greedish people, they also own and control the medical industry that makes a lot of money, as the American Indians say, money-hungry doctors. There's a lot of money-hungry people that live here in Ravenwood, especially among the, old, among the older folk. There's quite a few between Maryville and here, and in Nottawa County, there's a lot of millionaires in this area. And the one thing that is common among these millionaires is total greed. They remind me of a crab that just grabbed everything that comes in contact with. Reminds me of John Fogarty singing that song, Mr. Greed. Why do you got to have everything that you see? Mr. Greed! Why you gotta have everything you see? But, as my Amish friend says, and I've already said it, they notice among the folk they call the English, oh, it's all about number one. And many people in America serve that number one, that number one man. That number one, greed. They serve those who love money because they use it to make slaves out of all of us. So anyway, I would like to end this particular monologue by saying that, again, it behooves us to study the natural order of goodness versus the unnatural order of evil. Nature is orderly in a good way. But that which is unnatural is chaos and confusion. The natural order is freedom, but the unnatural order or unnatural chaos is slavery. So I'll go back to where I started. It's easy for me to talk about nature. But it's most difficult for people who have spent all their life serving the dollar and never taken the time to study the natural order and beauty of the grand council of creation. And the mastery of that grand order of the sun, the earth, and the moon, and the relationship of the air, and the water, and the land, and the fire, all working together. For it meant that we live in a beautiful environment. It meant that we pay respect, that we hold life is sacred, and that life is beautiful. The whole world is a garden if we look at it the right way. And to the coming new world, blessed be.